In 2047, a colony of scientists, farmers, soldiers, priests, artists, and AI, all looking for a new life, landed on Mars. The mission was simple, to survive and establish a... What happened? To survive and establish... We are so far beyond keeping it together. To survive and establish... Then you can come at me right now! To survive. Marsfall. Survival on the Red Planet. Marsfall is a science fiction podcast about the first colonists on Mars. Listen for free wherever you find your favorite podcasts. This is the Linda Steele Show on demand. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts and listen weekdays 3 to 6 on 980 CKNW and on the Radio Player Canada app. Jody Vance with you along with Eric Chapman and not to be knocked from the headlines. A very important story continues to require our attention and the spotlight. Eric. Yeah, I got to talk to a survivor today, Jody. What an honor. Um, The uh, residential school and death trap family hotline. If you are troubled or triggered by any of this is 1-866-925-4419. The First Nations Inuit Hope for Wellness helpline is 1-855-242-3310. And the Native Youth Crisis Line is 877-209-1266. Saskatchewan MLA Betty Nippy Albright. She's a survivor of the residential prisons, and I'm not going to call them schools anymore because they did not educate anything. So bring it up with me, eric at cknw.com. It's important to listen to these stories of the people that are willing to be open and share their wounds. I respect and honor anyone that has the strength to share, and I was privileged to be able to share some with Betty, and she shared with me her wounds and the traditions she participates in to help with the healing. Well, on Saturday, I went to a cultural ceremony back home and just asking for prayers for um, fellow myself and other residential school survivors to heal from the um, opening up these old wounds. So, um, yeah, we do. So that that is what I do as a, a Soto woman. I I take part in cultural ceremonies and um, I just ask for prayers for strength and courage to walk through what we're going through and also for for society to um, can open their eyes and hear um, what we're going through and, and what we're asking for. What are some of the, the emotions and things that you are going through? Well, you know, from when the discoveries in from BC and then with the the new ones here from Kwakatoos, the first time it was like for me as a as a survivor, but also as a mother and a grandmother, I thought I cannot imagine not being able to say goodbye. And then when with these discoveries here in in um, Kaosis, and I. It just opened up my own um, mm-hmm. um, wounds from and uh, triggering back to what I experienced and also what my siblings experienced. Um, one of my brothers um, was run over by a tractor and he was in the hospital for months. And in the summer when he, he came home, my mom and dad, who didn't know he was hurt nor in the hospital, saw this huge scar and asked him what happened. So those are things that it brought up. It brought up pain. It brought up these memories that we experienced. So this last, this whole week has been a lot of connecting with other residential school survivors and reliving those traumas and saying and and talking about that. And and with the discoveries of these unmarked graves, it brought back my own memories as a child going to the neighboring residential school for track and field and having talk discussions with fellow students about unmarked graves at their residential school. So, so it just brought back all of those. And, and um, it's been a very emotionally, um, very emotionally draining week, weeks, It has been because this has been nonstop. If there was 139 prisons, because I'm not going to call them schools, I refuse to. um, Yeah. um, This is going to happen possibly 136 more times. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. (sighs) When when these when this opened up, but the in BC, 
and I had residential school survivors reaching out to me, all of us were saying, this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. And I cried. I still cry today, and I'm still going to cry again when we hear more. Because it's it's something that we haven't, like, how long did it take society to recognize and to hear the abuse that we had endured in residential school? This is 2021, and hearing about unmarked graves. Yeah. You know, um, I s- certainly hope this is the, the moment where society comes together and says, you know, um, the, these racist policies, this is what happened, this is what we did to uh, a race, you know, um, and hopefully now is the time to make lives better for for Canadians as well as um, uh, all, all of us as citizens of this country. You mentioned there it took so long for things to be finally mm-hmm. recognized. That is really kind of emphasizes why we need everyone to step up when it comes to this, doesn't it? Because it can't, it, sure it, it, it can't take this long again. It just can't. It can't. And the federal, uh, look, when you look at the federal governments, uh, their responsibility, and also the provincial governments, um, there are for, and in, in Saskatchewan, um, our province uh, had two provincially run residential school. They have yet to take responsibility for their part in running those schools, and they have yet to release the records to the residential school survivors. This is 2021. And what federally and provincially, what governments can do, or what they need to do, is is really put their words into action. When they say they support Indigenous people, they need to walk their talk. They need to put more resources into helping us. This has, these discoveries of unmarked graves have opened up wounds for us as residential school survivors. Before the pandemic, we were struggling with mental health uh, services. And then the pandemic came and we needed more help. Now this discovery uh, has impacted many Indigenous peoples and even mainstream society. So there needs to be um, real dollars, uh, more dollars, into helping both on and off reserve First Nations, um, whether they're uh, survivors or not. Um, Urban centers need to have uh, places for um, mental health supports. Métis communities need to have support services available to them because there are many Métis children that went to residential school that have never not been recognized by Canada or by the provinces if they attended residential schools in the provinces. Who needs to be involved from the start with these programs? When we're creating any kind of programming or or doing any kind of consultation, First Nation, Métis, Inuit leaders need to be at the onset. We, it is no longer acceptable for us as governments uh, to create programs and go and sell it to the people. We need to get the community behind it from day one. We need to ask the leaders to be part of it. First Nation and in Indigenous leaders have to be at all intergovernmental decision making tables. That's where they need to be. That's where they need to have a permanent seat in there so that they have say and that they, because they're the ones that understand, they have the pulse of their communities. Or at the very least, they ought to have the pulse of their communities. They ought to know that. And we we need to stop creating things without community involvement, whether it's mainstream or Indigenous. We need to be inclusive when we're creating programs and services, and we have to do it in a meaningful way and stop this tokenistic uh, way of operating things and stop these colonial ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Betty, thank you very much for sharing with me today. I appreciate you opening those wounds and, and 
speaking, taking the time today. I really appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, miigwech. Uh, if you're triggered by any of this, the Survivors and Family Hotline is one 925 4419 Jody Vance with you. And it's one thing for some of us to be hot and jump in our pool or head to the beach or out for a drive in our air-conditioned vehicles. Maybe, yeah, set out on the day for somewhere cool. Lots of destinations, right? Well, it's an entirely other thing to be living in poverty in a pandemic, in an opioid crisis, in a, an affordability crisis, and now an unprecedented heat dome on top of it all. So once again, we're going to go to the difference maker that is helping out on the front lines of our most vulnerable. Executive Director of the Overdose Prevention Society, Sarah Blythe, is on the line. Hi. Sarah, thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, no, well, it's really tough times. Yeah, it really, really is. I mean, it, I can't us. tell you it's how hot the pavement is, and there's just no trees, and you know, or even much cover for people. So they're really, really living in a pretty stressful, terrible condition right now. But we've given out about six thousand uh, bottles of water in the past few days. So that's, you know, we're try- we're doing our best to try and meet the need, but it's really um, the heat is unbearable. And like you said, the overdose crisis overdosing on drugs and then also it being a part in the heat uh situation is just a it's a terrible combination for right people, it's a perfect so. it's a perfect storm i mean a, a yeah. body already at massive stress added the you know 40 degree temperatures on top of that let's talk about the supply of water that you have managed to secure i mean i, yeah. I follow you on social media and i see people you know stepping up you're, you're building water stations all over the place yeah. in the downtown east side and and how are you getting that supply do you need more how can we help the cknw listener stands at the ready yeah, I mean, mainly uh, if anyone wants to drop off some water as they're going through the downtown east side, if they want to bring a couple of flats and just hand them out that are cold, that's just great. Um, we do have a large amount of water, uh, even freezies, anything that's cold, um, that would be great. Umbrellas, maybe, uh, just ways, yeah, ways of, you know, spray bottles that people can spray themselves, some misting uh, type uh Things would be great. Yep. I have one Anything sitting right that, here. I've been I've been spraying myself in commercial breaks. I put the water in yeah. the fridge. I take it out. I spray myself. I imagine that a little would go a long way for somebody who is literally living in this heat twenty four seven with with no fan, no reprieve, no way to jump in a cool shower or a pool or what have you. Where would we drop stuff off like that? Are we bringing it to to you could, OPS? Yeah, I mean, you could bring it to OPS. At, um, we have an outdoor location. It's at uh, ninety nine West Pender, and you know, obviously cold drinks, um, uh, anything that you can think of that would be helpful to people would be great. Um, obviously, you know, we're seeing, we see up to about 800 people a day, so it's, wow. we can really help people, um, you know, we can help people get on the front lines what they need re- as they need it. So, I mean, that's so, one of the, the great things about where we're at is that we can uh, be on the front lines for when weather changes and all kinds of things happen and we can, you know, build up something to help people. So that's kind of what we're you doing. Do an, you do an amazing job, Sarah. 99 Thank West you. Pender now. OPS, the Overdose Prevention Society, has moved. If you've been down to the old location and that, that sliver of property uh, on Hastings Street, that that is no longer the location. This is, a, this is a new location with an outdoor space. So think about ways that you might be able to help with what you just have in your home or what you might have in your business. Do you have access to umbrellas? Do you have access to maybe a big freezer where you could, you know, go to Costco, grab a a bunch of freezies throw them in your commercial freezer and drop them off at ops you know later today yeah. once frozen like these are some of the creative ideas we can come up with here that don't cost a lot but go a long way or uh, you know everybody in every neighborhood there's homeless people in every neighborhood so True. even if you can just take care of uh you know uh, your local homeless population to make sure that you know they have something um that's really a help too um so if you live downtown and you know that there's some homeless people in a certain space, go down and give them something to drink. Uh, make sure, also for dogs, you know, there's a lot of homeless yeah. dogs. There's a lot of dogs out. Uh, dogs are dying right now. And make sure that there's, uh, you know, water out for them in different locations. And even some of the birds, some of the wildlife are pretty are suffering right now. So, yeah. you know, just, you know, when these things happen, um, take some time to think and help someone else and 
and uh, and it, you know it's it goes a long way if all of us do a little bit, right? We can help Truth. other people in a big way. So, and it feels good. To, it feels good to do something in this helplessness. There is a yeah. there's a feeling of like, what can I do? Well, here are some of the options. As simple as just putting some water outside your front door, or perhaps Absolutely. taking yeah. taking that Gatorade, uh, going and buying a bunch of Gatorade from yeah. the from the cooler. Remember, get it from the cold spot yeah. and just hand that around to people that need it. I mean, these are great things. I love the idea of umbrellas as well. Makeshift portable shade. Yeah, some shade, some, some uh, you know, anything that you can do to just do a little bit helps a lot if a lot of people do a lot. So, yeah, just, uh, and, and obviously, um, you know, some of the elderly folks that maybe live in social housing and, you know, a lot of people are really heating up in some of the old buildings, um, yeah. making sure that those folks are getting out because this is really going to be hard on seniors and, and really low-income people and uh, that they can't afford air conditioning they can't afford you know some of fans you know fans are great for for those types of folks so if you got an extra fan or anything um just even bringing it to the downtown east side a lot of people live in social housing and and they're just cooking Um, yeah eric was talking about the sros right they're not built for for ventilation by any stretch of the imagination 99 west pender is where you'll find the overdose prevention society 99 West Pender, Sarah Blythe is the executive director there of OPS. And this is this is a place that keeps people safe. This is a place that helps our most vulnerable. This is where you can literally drop off what you have that can be reused. And that outdoor space that you have now, I mean, just having like patio umbrellas, picnic tables. Do you got, do you have a, a you know, patio furniture that you don't use yeah. a couple of chairs and a stool? You don't want, you don't know where to put it. Don't put it on Facebook marketplace, take it down to OPS and let people Absolutely. use it right now. Right. That's great. Yeah, no, it's great. Just getting people undercover, getting people, uh, you know, ice. We don't have any ice. ice. You know, they're putting it on ice. They can put it in a bag and bring it down. It's really hard it's to get. It's literally as now. easy as ice. That is crazy. Yeah. What a great yeah. idea, Sarah. So yeah. listening, yeah. if you're listening right now and you are like, I have nothing to do and I'm going to hop into my air conditioned car and I'm going to go down to the gas station at the end of the street. I'm going to buy a bunch of bags of ice and I'm going to take them down to OPS. It's as easy as that. 99 West Pender is the address. And Sarah, you mentioned, I, I saw on your Twitter and you, you did mention caring for pets right now. Uh, Oppenheimer yeah. Park reopened this morning, uh, partially reopened this morning and there was a little bit of a vet clinic there, is my understanding. Yeah, no, we had one at Ops actually. We had oh, a vet did you? clinic there. Yeah, we had a vet oh, clinic there, you. and a lot of vets came in, or a lot of pets came in, and we have a pool actually at, at the overdose prevention site for pets and a little pet area for them Fantastic. with some like, fake grass. But obviously, they're suffering too, and so yeah. just making sure that they they've got lots of water and cool beds to lie on and things like that. And, uh, you know, the, obviously the wildlife, we, we're, we have a lot of crows and pigeons in the downtown east side. And so yeah. putting out some water for them and, and making sure that everybody, uh, you know, does it for, um, there's a lot of people that could use a lot of help. So, and a lot of, a lot of creatures too. So if you, if you want to, and you've got some time to get into your car, like you said, and, and yep. help out, help somebody out or even help someone out in your own neighborhood, that's a really great thing to do takes no time at all i've been down been yeah. down to ops and you just you stop up you pop on your hazards yeah you, you say hey i got some stuff and everybody just goes thank you and yeah, takes everybody's it. It happy yeah so no, happy. happy yeah, yeah. It, happy. it is a very they really need yeah. it they're very thankful and i'm you know i'm thankful that you brought us on to talk about this today well, you're just awesome. I wish we had more angels among us like you, Sarah Blythe. I appreciate Aww. everything you do, and I know Thank you're you. super busy. We're going to keep talking about it and sending people to you. And awesome. I'll, you know, we'll tweet this out. We'll put the message out there. And I know CKMW awesome. listeners will step up, and those who have businesses that can just drive right by there and help out. Uh, Absolutely. That's so great. It's, it's easy to help. Okay. It's, it is. Thank you. Take care. Okay, we have officially gone too far with the music. Just saying. That's pretty funny. We're in Christmas carols now. That's how that's how far down the heat dome we've all tumbled. I'm Jody Vance. This is CKNW Afternoons. I think that was Alan Regan who came up with that idea, I'm going to say, because I, I, I do believe I, that uh, Eric Chapman has been. Have you been in charge of music? Was that was that Alan or no, was that you, Eric? No, that's Tim. That was I believe that was Alan's suggestion. The magic is all done by uh, Tim, Tim on the board. But I just got a tweet from right. Craig saying, um, 
he was driving home after picking up his three and four year old from daycare. They were excited to hear, do you want to build a snowman? Thanks to all involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> we're just making it happen. Well, you do yeah. know, like, what's the day today? So three days ago, it's six months till Christmas, right? I have friends who post that because they know oh. it gives me like, Ugh! Dr. Ooh. Tim French running the show on the board. I love it. And Eric, I do want you in on this conversation because Teeny Turner, your little delicious, divine, oh. sweet little princess oh. of of a, of a chihuahua. What she's a special type of chihuahua, yes? Well, she's a deer head chihuahua, so she's got right. long Teeny Turner legs. That's why we call her that. Yeah, and I'm honestly, I'm really nervous about her today. I had We had a little issue yesterday, and I know she's just panting, but it seems like her breathing's a little off now. So I'm excited to um, to get some information about this. Well, here we go. Dr. Karsten Bant, the ER critical care vet at Canada West Veterinary Specialists, who, by the way, have been angels in my life uh, over my uh, dog mom years. Uh, Dr. Bant, thank you so much for joining us on the line. We really appreciate having you here for the next 20 minutes or so. Oh, you're welcome. So obviously you, you hear Eric, I, I'm Jody. that's Eric. <laughs> so it would be so fun to be in studio together and be able to talk with yeah. one another about our pets. We love our pets so much. And, and first, before we dive into specific questions and take uh, our, our listener phone calls, because we do want our listeners to ask specific questions about their the b- beloved furry uh, family members, um, can you give us just a little bit of an idea of the, the gravity of this heat dome and the impacts on our, on our pets? So we have seen a significant increase in um, patients coming in with heat strokes um, or just respiratory issues too, just from um, panting excessively over the last couple of days. And if you take a look at um, your dogs, um, dogs and um, cats, they, they, the only way to really regulate their um, temperature, so the only method of cooling down is panting. So if you, um, uh, and that usually works quite well, but in temperatures like that and especially our animals here are not as used to it like yeah. down south um, and it came pretty rapidly this year um, they run into problem quite quickly with that so what are we looking for if they are panting and that's fairly normal because dogs can't sweat should we be taking sort of uh, any sort of immediate action is, is are there are there things we can do um, that are maybe not obvious. Do we want to put them in a doggy pool? Do we want to put them in a cool bath? Or is that too much, or is it a good idea? So it, it's quite normal for a dog to pant, um, but um, that's usually just a few minutes after exercise. So, if, um, and the current situations are a little bit different. So we we have patients who will pant for like the whole day just because it's so hot in the apartments and houses right now, um, and yeah. it's even hotter outside. So that's a, a, a um, that's the time where we really get into trouble with these animals. So um, if you have a dog, and if you look at heat stroke, what we usually see, um, the first thing is um, they try to, if they're mobile enough, they try to uh, find cooler um, spaces. So they may lay flat out on the floor or um, yeah. other things we see, and then they get anxious. Um, they um, get a really anxious expression, and they may um, um, go into the, in these, Daring appearance modes, um, and then the next thing you see is these happy, heavy panting and the raspy um, breaths you can hear. And then if that's sustained over t- um, time, um, further on you, you see dogs and cats too. They get really bright red gums. If they get hotter, they might start hypersalivating, so they drool a lot. And if it gets a little bit worse, and um, they start may start vomiting too with that. In cases like that, you should cool down as quickly as possible. And depending on what the pet was doing before, if they were um, uh, exercising, for example, stop the exercise, um, cool them down. And the best method is really to hold them down with some water, um, dogs um, at least, um, hold them down with some water and try to cool them off as quickly as possible and bring them in a cool environment if that's possible. Um, you say cool them off as quickly as possible. Um, can we cool them off too quickly? Would it shock their system or should we do it gradually? Well, if you're in early stage of heat stroke or um, just heat um, e- exposure, you can um, 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 cool them down quite rapidly. Um, okay. If they are in full heat stroke um, with cardiovascular collapse, that's a little bit different. Then um, right. it, it might not help to cool them down really just because they don't really have any um, blood flow to their um um, skin or to the peripheral a- area. So even if you put cold water on that, um, they might not cool down at that point. So um, that's a little bit different. But if you have a, uh, if your pet just got overheated and it's a little bit hot before it gets 
for the worst, um, you can definitely close them down quickly. Okay, good to know. Let's open up the phone line 604-280-9898 or star 9898 is a free call. If you have a, a vet question for Dr. Karsten Bant, he is an ER critical care vet at Canada West Veterinary Specialist. And those who have had pets for a long time are very familiar with Canada West. It's the place where you go when you need the most urgent 24-hour care. Uh, and, and an ER critical care vet certainly would be able to uh, give us the best possible advice, free veterinary advice right here if you're concerned for or wondering what your best practices might be here. And I want to ask one question just before we go to break. Uh, Dr. Bant, if you don't mind, I've, I see lots of people saying, you know, give them ice cubes, give the dog ice cubes. I gave my dog ice cubes a number of years ago when I lived in, in Toronto thinking that was a good idea. And he choked on it. He tried to swallow it. And it was one of the most terrifying minutes of my life trying to get that out of his throat. Are ice cubes a, a, a good idea, a bad idea, or sometimes a little column A, a little column B? Well, it's, it's quite rare that they actually have problems with ice cubes, um, but um, that can happen with any treat um, that they can choke right. on them. So um, uh, we do use ice cubes like to cool down their water, and a lot of dogs do like ice cubes and um, chewing on ice cubes. Um, so um, it, it, it definitely can help. Jody Vance with you, along with Eric Chapman, and we're talking with Dr. Karsten Bant. He is the ER critical care vet at Canada West Veterinary Specialist. And doctor, prior to the break, we were going about, you know, the early stages of uh, heat stroke and what to look out for. Let's now sort of move to where we can't manage it at home. What are the signs we're looking for if it's like, okay, I need to get my pet to the vet stat? Okay, well... Um Maybe just start um, the, the couple of um, um, age groups and um, um, breeds where we're really concerned about where we okay. shouldn't really wait yes, um, to run um, uh, to wait. So um, any um, small dog with um, previous history of like um, what we call tracheal collapse, where the windpipe in small dogs like Chihuahuas, for example, um, um, a lot of them will have like mild problems with the windpipe, where they cough occasionally, especially when they get excited. Um, so any dogs who have um, problems like that, and then other dogs like breeds like pugs or pekinis or bulldogs, English bulldogs, for example, and, you know, who have a really short snout, um, they usually have problems breathing too and regulating the airway. And then um, the other ones we um, do see frequently running into problems are larger dogs like um, the older Labrador, the older German Shepherd, for example, who have um, some nerve problems on, on their windpipe or on their um, larynx, and um, they have a raspy vo voice, especially in summer, and these breeds really run into problems quite quickly. So we need to be mindful if we have one of those breeds. And certainly I had a senior dog, my Fenway just passed away. Uh, well, I guess we're coming up on a year ago, but he um, he almost made it to 16 years old and he was a, a mutt's mutt, but he was a fairly large dog. He was a 60 pound uh, collie cross. And and I really worried about him in the summer months because he was big and hairy and 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 he kind of labored around a little bit. But he seemed to be fine, like you said, if we would hose him down in the summertime or we put out the little kiddie pool and he would jump right into that pool. And do, do dogs, do you want to put the dog in a, in a pool situation or do you want to allow them to, to sort of put themselves in that? I know, you know, some dogs are not exactly water dogs. So um, it's nice to have the, um, th that they have at least access um, to it. Um, unfortunately, not all dogs are smart enough to use it um, as they get overheated. And the problem with dogs is, they're so eager to please their owner. So if um, you continue to play with them, um, even in a heat wave like that, they will try to play until they just the bodies just can't take it anymore. So, but um, it's nice to have something like that available uh, for them. If if they don't use it at all and they get overheated, um, um, just use the garden hose and um, um, cool them down. That's the best and fastest way um, to get the temperatures down. And that Good one. especially for. Um, dogs were a little bit on the overweight side and dogs with a really, really heavy hair coat. Okay. Um, with these, of course, hot temperatures, I know we've said it a thousand times, but do we want to watch the temperature of the sidewalk when we're walking with our dogs too? Because someone, yeah. someone had to duck into the, into the shade the other day when I was downtown and I was like, oh, how can she tell that the sidewalk is too hot for the dog? Will they show? Are they doing the tippy-tappy toes? Do you have any tips on that? 
So um, the the problem with that is a, um, a lot of the dogs, like I just said, they they really um, they attach to the owner. So if you go on a walk with your shoes on, um, they will still try to please you and follow their um, their right. leader. So if um, if you can't if you put your hand on the um, street or on the asphalt um, and you can't keep it up uh, keep it there without um, discomfort for more um, than 20 seconds then it's too hot for your dog and if you take a look at the temperature at the moment if you have a dark surface um, the temperatures go up to like 200 degrees on that you can literally right. cook an egg on it you know every everybody's trying to fry an egg on the sidewalk probably not the greatest <laughs> time to take your dog for a walk on the asphalt for sure now what about when you go i like to take my two i've got a, a yorkie and uh and a jack parsons terrier cross and like you said like they are such pleasers they'll go anywhere anytime if i say let's go they're all in uh, even if they're feeling the heat and i've noticed we've been going on our shorter duration walks should i be actually considering maybe not doing the walks on a day that is this hot like is there a point where we just say you know what this is too much well if you live in the city at the moment i wouldn't walk them during the day um, just because um the streets get so hot um, um they can easily burn their paws and even if it's um not immediately hurting them over time um if they go for a half an hour walk they're still going to have some damage to um their feet. yeah so um if you um, do walk them go get up early in the morning before the sun is really up and um burning on the streets um get up before six six and um, go ahead and do your um uh, exercise at that point yeah we're just keeping our eyes peeled i do make sure that i bring water with me in my car because we go up to the the pacific spirit park and do the shady walk and then making sure and they crush a you know a full swell bottle of water when we get back in the car like just how important is it to just, well, it's a rhetorical question, really. Like, it is very important, but how much is enough, I guess, water for dogs? I noticed my little Yorkie the other day pushed back probably a liter. Yeah. So um, it's very important for uh, them to stay hydrated because that's the only way to regulate their body temperature. They uh, regulate their body temperature by um, breathing out and um, when they breathe um, humid air out um, from the body system, um, that's how they cool down. And if they're dehydrated, they can't do that. So you really have to make sure that they get uh, stay hydrated. And all the pathophysiology um, of the heat stroke um, and the cardiovascular collapse we see with severe cases um, is much worse if they're already dehydrated um, coming right. in. What about food? Do we do we want them eating less on hot days like this, or just leave the food out as we usually would? Well, the food doesn't really make a whole lot of a difference um, for okay. the heat um, um, exposure, um, like the heat exposure. So um, you don't really have to adjust um, the food by yourself. A lot of the dogs and cats too will eat less if it's really hot. Okay. I'm glad that you brought up cats because they're not as people pleasers, uh, typically speaking. I mean, some are. Now, don't don't inundate me with emails about your loving cat. <laughs> but trying to try. I mean, that happens. Trying to yeah. keep on top of, um, you know, cat care. Are we looking for them to exhibit something differently than the dogs might, or is it pretty similar? No, it's uh, it's quite similar. It's just um. um with cats, uh, what we see, we um, because they don't really exercise as much um, as right. dogs, um, and they usually don't exercise outside as much, um, they run into a little bit less problems. But we do see, too, that cats will start panting. And um, especially if you look at uh, cat breeds like Persian cats, for example, with very short noses, um, they only yeah. have a um, diminished airway, um, and they have some problems freezing um, in the best now of times. So they're a little bit more likely to get uh, trouble into heat stroke too. And then the other thing about cats is um, a lot of elderly, elderly cats do have problems with um, either feline asthma or they have problems with um, heart disease, which might be well regulated um, with medications or just not to the point that they're um, having problems. But on top of that, um, this heat wave, um, they can run into problems too. And um, if you have a pet who's constantly panting at home um, over the last couple of days, it's really hard um, being at home trying to differentiate that from um, something more severe like an asthma attack or um, heart disease. Right. So we got to err on the side of caution if you're if you're fur fur baby, as we call them in our place, uh, it looks in distress. 
take them to the vet. Dr. Karsten Bant, ER critical care vet at Canada West Veterinary Specialist. We thank you for allowing us to bend your ear today. We appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Jody Vance with you alongside Eric Chapman. And Eric, we've been talking a lot about or dreaming a little bit about uh, when we can get out and about and move around a bit more, travel a bit. And both you and I are really into the staying local, BC, uh, Mm -hmm. being a tourist in our own town. And you did a piece, even when you were off work for a couple of days last week. And by the way, I'm so glad you're back. Um, Mm -hmm. You did a piece about sort of exploring your backyard. Oh. And I was kind of shocked that you'd never been to the Museum of Anthropology. I never, I, I've never been to Deep Cove either. So it's, it's weird. Okay, I, haven't these been, things, I haven't been. <laughs> these things must change. And one of the reasons why I wanted you to be by my side here is we welcome our next guest because I know that you will be, uh, along with me, the humble learner as we are tourists sort of in our own area here. There's so much to, to explore in beautiful British Columbia. But what about indigenous tourism in British Columbia and across Canada for that matter. Keith Henry is the president and CEO of the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada and joins us now on the line. Thanks for doing this, Keith. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. So where do we begin here? If somebody wants to uh, start to explore, Eric was bringing up in our morning meeting and I made a note here to bring it up as well. Uh, When we are um, sort of becoming the listener and wanting to be the humble learner, there are also some realities about the spirituality of some of these destinations and the responsibilities that come with those. Well, I think what we want Canadians, and of course here in Vancouver, we want Lower Mainland residents to do is just if they haven't uh, taken the time to experience Indigenous tourism experiences, there is still a lot of options for them. And as we reopen, we really hope people will go looking for that. So for example, if you're in downtown Vancouver, there's Squatch Eyes Lodge Hotel and Gallery. Yes, it's a, it's a, a hotel, but it's a beautiful gallery. It's got authentic Indigenous artwork. Uh, the staff there are really friendly to help you understand the meanings and some of the symbolism and understanding of some of the Coast Salish nations. And they actually have other artwork from there. That's one example that I'm sure many of your listeners may or may not be aware of. Um, I'm not aware. I need to know where that is. Can you say that one more <laughs> so, time? Because I immediately want to try that. Yeah, it's Squatch Eyes Lodge Hotel and Gallery. And obviously, people here may not be looking for a staycation in a hotel room, but maybe they will this summer. And uh, it's a beautiful gallery. It's right on Pender Street, uh, downtown Vancouver. And it's uh, one of the just boutique little hotels. We, we're seeing Indigenous businesses being formed across the country, and it's a really great example. And the artwork there is just, you know, world class. Um, all You know, we also have places like Salmon and Bannock. I know uh, it's pretty well known in Vancouver, but if you're looking for Indigenous culinary, of course, uh, it's on West Broadway. It's another great eatery. To, it's a boutique eatery, uh, authentic Indigenous culinary experiences right, right in our backyards right here. I think you're making some excellent points here. Um, we don't have to go far to have the Indigenous um, travel experience, do we? No, I think we all recognize that, you know, yes, it's reopening and we see this across the country with my, I guess, my lens on on what we're trying to do to help continue to generate more people to take interest in Indigenous experiences and learn the culture. But it starts with one small step at a time. And what we keep telling people is you don't need to go far and remote and have these, you know, major spiritual journeys. Why don't you just start by learning what's right in your backyard and a lot of us want to go afar, and but, you know, the travel restrictions are what they are. And, yes, we're all calling for things to reopen. But, you know, let's look for things in our backyard that just simple steps. And those are two examples. And there's more. I mean, uh, you can Keep go going. into Stanley yeah, Park, go. Talisade Tours with Candace Campbell. I mean, she, they run a guided walking tour experience to talk about the history of Stanley Park and what it was to the local people. And they have a great tour there. I mean, there's – and Deep Cove, I, I heard you talking about Deep Cove while well, – They've got, of course, Takaya Tours, and they do a canoe and kayak adventure right along up, you know, Indian Arm and right off uh, Kate's Park. I mean, so these are all, I probably not, it's funny how we in Indigenous tourism are as equally as, sometimes we go and promote to the world where these beautiful experiences are, and we forget that maybe even our local residents here don't always know, and those are just a handful of examples here locally. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point because the international traveler absolutely knows about these things, but us locals who would really love to to soak up that experience. I mean, it's so simple and it doesn't need to be expensive. I mean, that walking tour with Candace, I mean, I worked with her down at at Vancouver television a million years ago and, and her personal firsthand experience and stories 
are reflected in her storytelling in a way that is is so unique and and should be precious and frankly the light deserves to be shone on it let's let's point that lens to more destinations for people maybe if they wanted to go you know one up from the day trip is there somewhere that you could go and immerse yourself a little bit more are there uh, uh, other storytelling that could be a destination associated with it there's absolutely there's local there's local businesses here but of course we've got other places like if you haven't been to Haida Gwaii, I, I you know I know as it re- is reopening, there's some beautiful indigenous experiences on Haida Gwaii. I mean, uh, they've got they, they got their hotel, the accommodations, they've got a number of outdoor adventure experiences. You can immerse yourself in that. Uh, if you go up, obviously to the Okanagan and in, in, in Kelowna or Kamloops, there's a number of businesses, of course, in in uh, um, uh, in each of these cities that, that many people. May not realize, and, and the thing that I think is very interesting. I mean, we have, I'm sorry, Indigenous World Winery and, and West Bank and Kelowna. There's Love all that. sorts of type of immersive experiences, and what we want people to realize is there's those cultural adventure, but there's also just you know many Indigenous owned businesses like the wineries that that just provide. Yeah. Just you're going to buy these services anyway. So it really depends what you're looking for, and what I would just say to everyone is we do have two key platforms that people can look and they can create a package. They can be immersed for a few hours, or, or uh, you know, just to you know, uh, take a surface level look, or they can spend three, four, or seven days doing these things. And it, it, so there's destinationindigenous.ca, or there's indigenousbc.com. I mean, th- there are tools out there for people to kind of uh, consider, dream their destination, and, and have a better understanding of how to immerse themselves, especially at a time with what we're discovering in this country. I think it's really it's an opportunity for us to show our support. It is indeed. You said those websites really quickly. Destinationbusiness.ca, did you say? No, sorry. Destinationindigenous.ca. No Indigenous. Space. Destinationindigenous.ca and indigenousbc.com. Those are the, that's a BC specific platform with our partners at Indigenous Tourism Association of British Columbia. And then, of course, we run the national platform at Destination Indigenous to give people an understanding of how, you know, these are some of these are beautiful destinations. There, there are lots of accommodations, transportation, food services, activities, and getting to understand the true history and story of this country alongside of having a great holiday is, I think, a really, I think is a really, um, you know, I think it should be a tremendous opportunity for Canadians uh, at this particular time, given what we're learning in this country. It's giving me relief to listen to you because it's a welcome, right? It's like, please come learn, be part of this, support Indigenous businesses, support Indigenous tourism, where many might feel, and and I know that that this is on my mind as well, I don't want to be at all exploitive. I would like to be supportive. I don't want to be like, okay, there's a headline now, and all of a sudden it's, you know, on vogue to try and do something. I want to actually do something. And I know Eric feels that way, and we talk about that at our team meeting, not wanting this to just be a headline that goes away. Is there a way to best support and share the share the word of these um, opportunities that you're offering up through the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada? Absolutely, I, I really urge people that we want that. Like I'm, I'm from an Indigenous community. I work with thousands of Indigenous entrepreneurs and community-owned businesses. But we want people to, to discover authentic. And what we mean partially by that authentic experience is that it's owned and operated by our people. It's owned and operated by our communities. The benefits are there. And that's important to us, especially now more than ever. So these platforms are the kind of places you can look to find these. We've created packages. Like We've been doing this for a lot of years. It's just Canadians and British Columbians and people here in the Lower Mainland may not fully understand that these tools are there and so we just want to keep educating and we don't want people to feel helpless you know we as a country need to heal right now and we think that indigenous tourism is a really strong uh, angle and platform for people to do that destinationindigenous.ca indigenousbc.com keith henry president and ceo of the indigenous tourism association of canada i have a feeling this is the first of many conversations we're going to have thanks for the welcome you, you bet thank you for having me on the show Thank you for listening to the Linda Steele Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe for free at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you get your on-demand audio. And join the conversation. You can reach me on Twitter at Steele Talk, on Facebook, and by email, Linda at CKNW.com. Talk to you next time. I'm Sarah Ritchie. I'm a reporter for Global News in Halifax. I was working the day everything changed in Nova Scotia last April. 
My team has spent the last year asking tough questions about how a gunman disguised as a police officer murdered 22 people over 13 hours. On our podcast, 13 Hours Inside the Nova Scotia Massacre, we examine this tragedy hour by hour. We're learning there's a lot more to this story. Listen to all 13 episodes now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Podcasts.